So welcome to Scratch Conference 2018. It's really great to have so many people from so many places joining us here at the Media Lab. It's great to see a lot of longtime friends who've been using and supporting Scratch for so many years. In some ways, the conference feels a little bit like a family reunion. You could see it last night with people getting back together and hugging one another. At the same time, it's great to see so many new faces and people joining, some of them just getting started with Scratch. I want to welcome them to the Scratch family and really look forward to the next few days to have the opportunity for all of us to be sharing ideas and exchanging stories and learning from one another. I really you know, felt that last night the reception kicked things off in a really special way that for me it highlighted the diversity of the Scratch community. At the end of the evening, as I thought back about the conversations I had during the evening, I realized that I talked to people from more than 25 countries. I actually counted them up. Uh, you know, it was you know, from you know, Mexico to Brazil to Chile to France to Poland to Italy to Morocco to Nigeria, Kenya, China, Japan, Korea, all over the world and many more. So it's just really exciting to have people coming together. But it's not just the geographic diversity. You know, through those conversations, you know, I, I was, it was great to see all the different ways that people around the world are using Scratch. I remember talking to one uh, teacher from an all-girls elementary school in Mexico, and she was telling me about how their, you know, in their class, the second graders are creating interactive bracelets using Scratch to program micro bits to flash hearts and other patterns. And I talked to a teacher from Austria who really has a deep commitment to supporting a culture of integrity and respect in his classroom. So he really engages his kids in using the Scratch online community where they're you know, diving in and getting a deeper understanding of the opportunities and importance and also the challenges of building an inclusive and respectful community. And I talked to one retired teacher from Detroit here in the United States who actually had never used Scratch in her classroom, but after retiring, she learned Scratch from her granddaughter and now was working on Scratch projects throughout the whole day as you know, translating them for her, for her relatives in Spain and in Italy and looking to see how she can start developing some professional development opportunities so she can share her enthusiasm with other teachers. So to me, you know, we can just, it's clear that there's a real incredible, diverse, and extraordinary collection of people here, and I really can't wait to have more conversations over the next few days. As we started planning this conference, I realized that this conference is falling almost exactly 10 years after our very first Scratch conference. It was July 26th, 24th, 26, 2008, almost to the day, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, and through those 10 years, obviously, a lot has changed in those 10 years. At the first Scratch conference, we had about 200 people. This year, we have about 600 people, and we're bursting at the seams, and we could have a lot more. As many of you know, we sold out a few months ahead of time. 10 years ago, at the first Scratch conference, there's about 150,000 projects shared in the Scratch community, and we thought that was a lot. Today, there's more than 37 million projects shared in the community, and every day there's about 30,000 new projects. So every five days, there's as many projects shared as in the whole first year of Scratch. Also, in that, you know, 10 years ago, the focus was really just on Scratch. And today, you know, there's all these different Scratch-associated initiatives with, from Scratch Ed to Scratch Junior to Scratch Day, and you'll have opportunities in the next few days to learn a lot more about all of those other initiatives. You know, so I really, you know, as we you know, move forward with this, I think that there's, you know, even though some things have changed a lot in the last 10 years, there are a lot of things that have really stayed the same. That we've really, you know, some things that haven't changed, and important things that haven't changed, are the goals and the motivations and the values that underlie our work in, on Scratch. You know, from the very beginning, we saw Scratch as more than just a programming language. We saw it as a way to provide children around the world an opportunity to express themselves creatively and to develop as creative thinkers. We've taken seriously the idea of Scratch as a new type of literacy. So we really always are working hard and we want kids to be able to, we want to provide them with opportunities to express their ideas and to organize their ideas and to share their ideas with others, just as they do when they're learning to write. And I think you know, as we do that, you know, we see that it's one of the most important ways that 
kids that for all kids need these new opportunities. It's not saying just for a limited number, but these types of capabilities of expressing and organizing and sharing ideas are important for everyone from all backgrounds in all parts of the world. So we've had this deep commitment to make sure that Scratch is always you know, accessible and appealing and empowering to all children in all places and in all backgrounds. Now, of course, as Scratch continues to grow and, you know, and change and extend itself around the world, there's some real challenges of how we can stay true to those values and to its mission. I think that's one of the big challenges ahead of us, to make sure that we stay true to it, so that Scratch isn't just used to teach you know, some particular concepts, as important they may be, but to provide opportunities for children to develop their thinking and to develop their voice. And we know that's not easy to do. It's a lot easier to just spread the technology than to spread the ideas and the values. But I think that's one reason I'm so excited about having all of us together for the Scratch conference, was the conference provides us an opportunity to all of us to come together and to share ideas and to share stories of how you know, children are creating and sharing with Scratch and how and strategies for supporting them. So there'll be lots of opportunities over the next few days for all of you to be sharing ideas with one another. But maybe just to start, let's take just a couple minutes, we'll take two or three minutes just to talk to people around you, to introduce yourself and to share what you're doing with Scratch and some of the things you're hoping to learn from the conference. So we'll gather another just two, three minutes. So I hope you were able to get started on conversation. There'll be lots more opportunities over the next few days to continue. Yeah, as you know, the theme of this year's conference is the next generation. Uh, and part of it, of what brings us together, is I think all of us have this deep commitment to supporting the next generation of children, to provide them with opportunities to imagine, create, and share so that they can uh, you know, help shape the future. And I think if we really want to you know, gain an appreciation of how children are using Scratch to imagine, create, and share, it's best to hear from the children themselves, to hear their stories and their voices. So I'd like to share three stories of three Scratchers, three members of the Scratch community. And the first story comes from a Scratcher whose username is Cool Jules. And we first found you know, about Cool Jules when she responded to a prompt that was put up by Natalie Rusk in the Scratch community. And Natalie posted a question to Scratchers saying, why do you Scratch? And asked them to post projects about why do they Scratch? And hundreds of kids posted projects explaining what brought them to Scratch. And then a graduate student in our group, Shruti Darwal, collected some of those stories into a lovely book called Why Do Scratchers Scratch? So I'll be telling the story that, that Shruti captures uh, from Why Do Scratchers Scratch? And this is the project that Cool Jules had shared on the community. And I'll show some screenshots that were then put in the book where Cool Jules talks about why she scratches. And she says, you know, so why do I scratch? Scratch is something I can express myself with and share my creativity, ideas, inspirations, and art with. You can make anything here from art to a game and so much more. The possibilities are endless. The whole community is amazing and you make so many friends here. Everybody here is so kind, creative, and accepting. To be really honest, I never thought I'd be into coding until I found Scratch. It was love at first sight. <laughs> and I think Cool Jules is exactly the type of young person we were trying to attract as we created Scratch. As I read through Cool Jules' story, it made me think about uh, some of the principles that we've had for guiding us as we develop Scratch. We sometimes call them the four P's of creative learning, projects, passion, peers, and play. As I read Cool Jewel's story, it, to me it seemed that her learning and her creativity really were supported by projects, passion, peers, and play. That she was working on projects based on her passions, in collaboration with peers, in a playful spirit. And I think that's what really helped her develop her ability to express herself creatively and to think creatively. And for me, I think this is a key as we all try to spread the spirit and the values of Scratch around the world. These, guiding, these four Ps can serve as a guiding framework. We can all work to see how can we better support young people 
to work on projects based on their passions in collaboration with peers in a playful spirit. I'll go on to my second story, highlights a young person in the community uh, whose Scratch username is uh, Forever, and his real name is Jinho. And here's a video uh, that was made, actually, Champika Fernando and Eric Schilling in our group worked on the video, uh, highlighting some of the ways that Jinho has interacted in Scratch. I, I remember reading the news and thinking that I should do something about this, but I didn't, I didn't know what I should do about it. And then I listened to this song, Hands. It featured different artists coming together and singing a song together. And I thought, why couldn't we as Scratchers create something together? I have a multi-animator project that like, we as Scratchers like, made together after the Orlando tragedy that happened to honor the people who died in the Orlando tra tragedy. Okay. Uh, this project is a multi-animator project, which means that each, like, each part was animated by a different animator, and we all stitched it together to create the final product. I think around 40 or 50 people were involved making that project. Scratch is a really open place where you can like share anything you want and you can express your feelings however you want. And I think that's a really beautiful part of it. My hope for the project when I shared it with the community was to be able to reach out to some of the other people in this generation and know that there are people who support them. And, yeah. If you look at the project, clearly you can see that Jin Ho and his colleagues and that he worked with on this are developing lots of computational skills. Also, they're clearly being guided by those four Ps of working on a project that was clearly based on passions in this collaborative multi-animator project, working with peers uh, and experimenting in new ways in a playful spirit. But I think as we look at this project, we also, to me, it brings to mind a fifth P, uh, the P of purpose. And I think this time that we see more and more of young people using Scratch to work on projects that, are, that they really want to try to make a difference in the world, to see how they can work on things that really make a difference in their community. And this end, I think we're thinking about more. In fact, there's a session at the conference about the fifth P of purpose. I think something else we want to continue to think about of adding purpose to the projects, passion, peers, and play. I'll tell my third and final story. And there's a story uh, about a project by a scratcher with the username ZeptoPower006. Uh, who's on the autism spectrum and shared this project as a way of sort of sharing some of his thoughts about his interactions in the world. So let me share the project with you. Hi, my name is Alex. And this is my story. Some of my favorite hobbies are playing video games and drawing. I've been creating comics for a very long time. I'm very good at math and coding. I'm very funny, kind, and smart. I also have autism. Autism affects me in many ways. It makes me think different. Sometimes in math I would solve problems in ways that even my teachers didn't think of. You think they know it, but no! Sometimes when I need to think, I pace. It helps me concentrate and it's called stimming. My teachers let me do this because it helps me think. Autism makes me a very picky eater. I like crunchy foods and I don't like mushy foods because they make me gag. The texture of the food bothers my senses. My senses are supercharged and sometimes that makes me feel uncomfortable. Sometimes I get really overwhelmed by bad feelings and I just want people to be understanding and patient. It's okay to be different. However, some people don't treat different people very nicely. 
I, there is just so much no with that decision. I wish people would treat different people completely normally. Being different makes the world more diverse. If everyone was the same, then the world would not be very interesting. I think that the secret to a good life is to just you be you. Pick your path and accept others for which path they choose. Be kind. That is my story. So that was one of my favorite scratch projects in the last few years, because for me it really captured you know, some of the essence of what we're trying to do of provide opportunities for everyone from all backgrounds to develop their voice and to share their ideas. And the way it says, you be you, that's what we want to do with Scratch. We want everyone to you be you. That we know there are many different pathways that kids are going to engage in the world uh, and trying to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to you know, be themselves and to find their own pathways to be able to live up to their full potential. So I think in you know, all of these you know, projects, from Cool Jewels to Jinho Forever to Zepto Power 006, uh, I think they sort of capture some of the spirit of Scratch. And as, as, for those of us on the Scratch team here at MIT, as we look at projects like this, and of course there are millions of others like this on the website, I just chose these a few examples, you know, we get lots of, we're always taken by surprise by the type of things kids do that we never imagined. Uh, and we're always amazed and delighted and inspired by what it is the kids do. And we're always trying to take it into account as we think about you know, extending and further developing Scratch, whether it's the software, the community, or the activities, try taking inspiration from members of the Scratch community. And that really brings us to another aspect of the theme of the next generation. Because as many of you know, we've been working on a next generation of Scratch itself that we call Scratch 3.0. And I think we've always been inspired by the community that we really want to make sure that we develop a next generation of Scratch that's worthy of the next generation of kids. Uh, so we've been you know, working hard at it. There's a you know, team here working on it. I hope you have you know, a chance through the conference to meet some of the you know, couple dozen people that are working on Scratch here. Uh, but I'd like to spend some time to give an update on some of the things we're working on Scratch to invite three leaders of the team uh, to come join me on stage, Andrew Slowinski and Natalie Rusk and Champika Fernando. I think we'll start with Andrew, who's been leading the, the team developing this next generation of Scratch, leading it's a big design and engineering effort. So Andrew will give a bit of an update about some of the thinking that's gone into uh, the work on Scratch 3.0 and the sneak peek of some of the things with it. Sure. So thank you. Um, so I think, as Mitch was just saying, when we look around the Scratch community, we see just such an incredible diversity of the things that kids are making. Um, and it's incredibly inspiring. And when we look at the kind of scale that we're, that we're reaching, you know, over the last 12 months, both the online and offline versions of Scratch have been used by over 200 million kids. That's a whole heck of a lot of kids. But when we think about our mission, we're really thinking about how do we make sure that all of these kids are, are reaching and, and being touched by the big, powerful ideas that underlie our work that Mitch was just talking about. And so when we were thinking about the next generation of Scratch, I think the question for us was really, and the foundational goal for us was really, how do we make sure that we're reaching kids where they're at? How do we make sure that these opportunities are available for all children everywhere from all backgrounds? And so, a major way in which we do that is we use the creative learning spiral that some of you may have seen before, um, where we hope that kids who are using Scratch are imagining, creating, playing, sharing, and reflecting um, as they're using Scratch, as they're doing these creative learning activities. Um, but in the same way, that same process can be used to, to, to describe our process for how we develop Scratch, for how we build Scratch, for how we interact with children, see the way that they're using um, the types of tools that we're building for them and make it better, make it stronger, make sure that these powerful ideas are accessible to all. And so when we think about the goals that we have for the next generation of Scratch that we call Scratch 3.0, 
really the, the primary foundation really is this idea of reaching kids where they are. And there's a lot of different dimensions of that. There's everything from making sure that Scratch is easy enough to use, that it's intuitive, that it's easy to pick up and start to play with and start to have a creative, tinkerable experience with. But it also ha talks about localization and accessibility and all of these different dimensions that are so important for us to, to fulfill our mission. So when we look at Scratch 3.0 as it is today, we're really excited about the progress and really excited that at the conference, there's going to be lots of opportunities for you folks to take a look at this next generation of Scratch. Um, and when you look at the, the, the coding area, right, so this is Scratch 3.0, um, it still kind of looks and feels like Scratch. Um, but the team has done a lot of work to, to make a lot of these refinements, to, to make things simpler, to make it easier to kind of get started, to make it easier to, to, to really go from zero to hello world, and then hello world to whoa, right? Like we want to get kids to that moment of joy, that moment of seeing the possibilities in Scratch. And we've done a lot of work in the, the coding side of things, but we also know that Scratch is more than just a programming language. There's also a paint editor, which is incredibly important, as you just saw in some of the projects that Mitch just showed. Um, and the team's done a great job of um, refining a lot of the paint editor to make it easier to get started with, but also to make it a little bit more powerful so that kids can do the types of animations that they want to do. And also to make some of the features of the paint editor that today are a little bit tricky to get working with, things like gradients, and try to make those more accessible, make those easier for all kids to use. Another place where we've spent a lot of time is sound. Um, and the team really sort of took a step back and, and through doing a lot of workshops with kids, tried to look at how are kids using sound in Scratch? What are the opportunities for us to sort of transform sound from something that you just kind of you know, grab from the library and add to your project to something that you can play with, something that you can tinker with, something that you can really have fun with, make that a part of the medium as well. And another area where we've spent a lot of time is the actual libraries themselves. Um, so in addition to adding a whole bunch of new sprites and, and sounds and, and backdrops to the library, we've also spent a lot of time making the libraries a little bit easier to use and introducing search into the libraries, which is something that we all know from our experience working with kids that kids find incredibly intuitive just to be able to search for what they're looking for. Um, and on the library side, we were lucky enough to be able to partner with a large number of incredibly talented artists. Some of those artists are actually scratchers um, to produce new assets for the library. So now we, we're making sure that we have everything from food trucks to boom boxes to toucans to zebras, um, really making sure that we're going broad with the range of in interest that kids bring to Scratch. Um, and last but not least, I think one of the other parts that's really important about reaching kids where they are is making sure that we're on the platforms where kids are. So Scratch 3.0 is the first version of Scratch that we've ever had that works on desktop devices just as it does today, but it also works on touch devices including Android and iOS tablets as well as Chromebooks. Um, <laughs> And later this, uh, later, early next year, when we launch the full version of Scratch, um, you'll also, this will be the first version of Scratch where you'll also be able to play Scratch projects on your phone. Um, <laughs> I think one of the other major pieces of Scratch 3.0 and one of the big, big goals for us has been expanding the possibilities of what Scratch can do. We know that so many kids love making games. They love making animations. They love making multiplayer projects. They love doing all of these different things. They love making pen projects, you name it. But we also know that there's a lot more opportunity out there. Um, and we've seen through, through our testing and through working with kids just how excited they can get when we connect Scratch to hardware, when we connect Scratch to the physical world, when we connect Scratch to things like speech. Um, and so we've spent a lot of time developing a new platform um, within Scratch 3.0 called Extensions um, that really change the possibilities um, and expand what you can do with, with Scratch. Um, so one of the first examples that I'm going to show, and hopefully this all works, is um, we've been really excited about working with the Microbit team um, on our integration with the, with the Microbit. Um, and one of the things that I'm really excited to show you is kind of how that works. So let's, um, 
build a little project here. So I'm going to add the space backdrop. And then I'm going to get rid of the cat. We're going to replace the cat with the dog. Hopefully that's OK. Um, so I'm going to search for dog. And I get all the dogs. And now I have dot. And so down here in the bottom left-hand corner, this is the extensions library. So I'm going to click on that. And then I'm going to connect to the micro bit. I'm going to make sure that my micro bit is powered on. It's going to look for devices. I'm going to connect it, connected. And now that it's connected, what I can do is just start to really quickly build an interactive program. So I can connect the A button press <laughs> to, to just playing the sound of bark. And I can make another little stack here. And I'm going to use another new feature. Uh, which is changing sound effects. So I can change the pitch effect. And I can change that to the tilt angle of the micro bit. And so now, if I start this stack, we can go. <laughs> and we can move our little puppy here. And let's add a little bit more interactivity. We'll make, we'll make Dot the dog, the space dog. Move and oh, we'll activate this, and now we can go. <laughs> Very musical dog. Um, uh, and so, um, just using something as simple as that, we can go from zero to a playful experience really, really quickly. And I think that's trying to deliver on both the simplicity of Scratch, but also um, expanding the possibilities of what kids can do, right? And, Using low-cost hardware like the microbit, we really see a lot of potential. Um, and, and the microbit is by no means the only hardware extension or software extension that we're working on. Microbit is one of many. Um, so microbit's been a great partner for us, but we're also working with folks like Lego and Sphero and the Raspberry Pi folks are here. Um, who we're also working on uh, extending Scratch into the physical world with, with all of these different types of platforms. And then on the software side, there's also a bunch of really tremendous opportunities for us to extend Scratch to do things like speech recognition, or text-to-speech, or object detection, all sorts of different things that we're working on with different types of software partners like um, Amazon Web Services and Google. But that's by no means the end. This is just the beginning of what we're working on right now. And so um, I guess a few frequently asked questions is kind of the next piece. Um, one of the questions that, that I know that you folks are going to ask me is, when can you get access to this? I'm very happy to say you can get to it right now. Um, so the team pushed this live uh, yesterday. So you can go to beta.scratch.mit.edu um, and use that during the conference. And there's going to be a whole bunch of different workshops and sessions that will be using this beta um, throughout the next couple days. Um, the other big question is, when will the full version launch? Right? Like, When will it be available in the community for, for all kids to use? Um, and the answer for that is January 2nd, um, so right after the New Year's. Um, and one thing that you'll notice on here is um, the beta, we're actually not going to, you all are getting like a special preview of it today. Um, but the, the beta will actually become available for all kids on the Scratch community um, on August 1st, so next Wednesday. Um, and we're really excited. And the kids are also very excited. So, um, And I think last but not yeah. least. And also, just to be clear, oh, so the, so the, and the beta, when it comes out, will be separate from the community. So yep. people can do that. But they can still go to the, to, to the current Scratch website to continue to share things in the community. Yep. And they'll be integrated into the community on January. Yep. On January 2nd, um, the Scratch 3.0 will become the sort of foundation for the community as well. Um, and then last but not least is how can I learn more about Scratch 3.0 at the conference? So there's a lot of different opportunities. There's a whole range of different sessions. Today, there's two workshops that many of you have signed up for that are now full. Um, Scratch 3.0 workshops, but have no fear. There's lots of other opportunities as well. Um, tomorrow, there are going to be multiple Scratch 3.0 studios happening in the cube um, with a whole bunch of different members of the Scratch 3.0 design and development team um, and resources team supporting that. Um, and then in addition to that, on Saturday, we have a special session um, that's going to be um, 
a whole bunch of members of the actual team that built Scratch 3.0 um, on a panel together, talking a little bit about the process, talking a little bit about the design, and answering questions that you might have. So if you want to learn more about extensions, or you have questions about how we've built 3.0, or have questions about the process, that would be a great session for you. Um, and then last but not least, I think the most important thing is to look for the the um, orange Ask Me buttons um, that a lot of members of the team are all wearing. Um, and if you have questions, if you see us during lunch or during dinner or any other time, feel free to ask us questions, and we'd be happy to chat about it. Thanks. Great. OK, thanks, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as we introduce Scratch through Pernell, of course, we want to make sure that they're, you know, Lots of ways to help kids and educators get started with Scratch. So we've been putting a lot of thought into how can we better support those introductory experiences and what type of resources and support materials can we provide to help support people who are just getting started. So Natalie Rusk, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Natalie has been working on the Scratch project since day one, since before it even had the name Scratch, and has led a lot of the efforts in uh, learning research around Scratch and leading up the development of resources around Scratch. So um, our resource team, we now have a great Scratch learning resource team. And our challenge is really, how do you design learning resources that spark that creative learning, those four Ps? And some of the things that I want to share with you and that we're going to be interested in sharing with you throughout the conference are some of those ideas that we've been working on. And um, it's been inspired by some of you have used the scratch coding cards. So these cards, and these were really developed with this idea that were inspired by actually Seymour Papert's ideas about that education has little to do with explanation and how do you dive in. He also talked about how using ideas comes before understanding them. So rather than explaining the concepts, how do you have something that right away, oh, I want to make this happen. I want to make something jump around. How do I do that? And on the back, it has some coding. And it shows you, how do I do that? And we've been doing it in different interest areas. And a lot of these are inspired by projects that we see young people on the community making, like virtual pets. OK, that's a topic that has sparked a lot of interest and ideas and thinking. So how do we make that available to more people through these scratch coding cards that have been available and now, thanks to a lot of you, translated into different languages? So how do we bring that so that when someone opens up Scratch 3.0, they can have a similar experience of just diving in and starting to play? So um, yeah, we've also had these educator guides that help show how do you use those cards. So here in Scratch 3.0, you're going to find a whole set of tutorials that have that idea of just diving in and getting started. And I'm going to show you in Scratch. So in Scratch, you'll now find there's a button at the top that says Tutorials. Finding my cursor. There it is. So if you click on that, there's a little light bulb next to it. You'll get popping up a choices. And these are just the beginning. We're going to be expanding on it. But let's see, for example, how do I change size of something? And if I look at that, I can play the video. With the change size block, you can make a sprite get bigger or smaller. To keep going, you can use a repeat loop. Or type in a minus sign to get smaller and smaller. To reset size, you can use the set size block. 100 will get it back to the original size. Or try a bigger or smaller number depending on what you want. Choose your own sprite and try it out. So we're hoping that that will help, not uh, just a little short thing, but it gives you some sense of some idea and some concept to start playing around with, with your own things. We also have in the tutorial window, some of the more starter projects, like how would I get started on making something? So that's one thing I can start trying out. But how would I do something like making a game or animating my name or making music? So these also, you'll see, 
If you play, it has a video that shows you what are some possibilities that you could do. And then you can see what are the steps. And just right here in the editor, without going anywhere else, you can start following along. It just has enough, again, to hopefully spark interest, get ideas started, and then seeing how young people start remixing, using their own ideas, and just building on these ideas. So we're looking forward to, again, at the Scratch Studio, we'll be sharing those and talking about it. You can just start exploring those at the beta.scratch. Um, and just a really important mention, as I said, that these have been translated into other languages. And right now, the current version of Scratch is translated, thanks to a lot of you in the community, translated into more than 50 languages. Scratch 3 is getting there, and a lot of you also have been working on that. We could really use more translators and also more reviewers if you speak a language to see, OK, is this making sense? And we especially need people like you who've tried out Scratch, who've used it with young people. What are the words that really make sense for localizing this? So this is both for the resources and for this. And to find out more about that and just to talk to us, we'd love to meet those of you who have been working on it or are interested in contributing. There's going to be a poster today at 4.30 to 5.30 on the third floor. If you can't make it then, um, there's also an email. You can email our translation team at translate at scratch.mit.edu and let us know what you're interested in doing and we'll connect with you. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. And with all the things we're trying to do, even though the Scratch team here has been growing, we know we can't do things by ourselves. The same way we're reaching out to, to partner with others on translation, we are having a growing number of ways of collaborations and partnerships. And that's one thing that Champika will talk about. Champika has contributed to the team in many different ways over the years. She actually was helping on the team that put out Scratch 2.0 and helped in the development of Scratch 2.0, uh, went away for a while, was a student for a while came back and is now heading up a lot of the efforts in outreach and communications. And she'll talk about some of the work we're doing in connecting with others around the world. Thanks. All right, thanks, Mitch. Um, so I'm going to bring it full circle back to community, what Mitch was talking about in the beginning. Um, and so just to reiterate, you know, when we think about Scratch, when we talk about Scratch, uh, it's not just the programming language and the editor. It's this massive global community, all of you um, who share our ideas and this commitment to the next generation of kids and next generation of creators. Um, and so I want to take a moment and just highlight, we've, you've heard some of the things that we're working on with uh, Scratch 3.0, but I'm going to take a moment and highlight some of the things you guys are doing in the community. Um, and so I'll start, actually I'll start with a few um, organizations that we've had the opportunity to work with to make sure that when Scratch 3 comes out, there's lots and lots of like really great free resources available. Um, so our friends at Harvard on the Scratch Ed team have been working to update their uh, creative computing curriculum guide so that it's ready for Scratch 3.0 when it launches in January. Um, our friends over at Code Club, uh, uh, sponsored by the Raspberry Pi Foundation, are working on updating all of their tutorials and activities online so that all the code clubs around the world will have uh, updated resources for Scratch 3.0 as well. CS First, our friends at Google, will be updating all of their video tutorials to make sure that those are ready. And uh, we've been continuing to do our work with Cartoon Network to create some new tutorials around Scratch 3.0 using their characters, some of my favorites, the Powerpuff Girls. Um, but, and you know, we feel really lucky to be working with some of these really amazing organizations, but um, we're actually even more inspired by the thousands of other folks, including many of you in the room, who are producing uh, resources and materials uh, for your local communities. And so actually, if you do do that, we would love to hear um, about the resources that you're creating. If you go to this uh, link, bit.ly, uh, slash scratch dash resource dash developers. You can fill out a form and tell us about the resources you're developing and also uh, join our resource developers mailing list so that we can keep you updated on uh, sort of the development of Scratch 3.0 and how you can think about updating your resources and getting them ready for the launch. Um, and so it's not just uh, resources and uh, activities that people are producing and, and, and sort of 
that's not the only way people in the community are engaged. Um, some of you may have been to or even hosted your own Scratch Day. These are activities that are hosted all around the world uh, in homes, uh, community centers, schools, offices, um, and they're organized uh, around, they're, acti they're one day activities that bring together kids, parents, families uh, to create and share around Scratch. Um, and the first one was actually hosted here at MIT, and then in 2009, we put out resources for how to host your own. And since then, it's, it's grown to be this global thing that's hosted all around the world. And actually, this year, um, there's been already more than 1,000 that have been hosted um, in more than 60 countries around the world. And of course, there's a Scratch conference, which is where you are right now, in case you didn't know. Um, uh, and that, again, the first one was hosted, as Mitch said, here at MIT. Um, with the idea of bringing together uh, educators to share ideas and learn from one another. Um, and, and each year it's been hosted either here at MIT or elsewhere. There's been one Scratch conference. But last year there were actually uh, half a dozen Scratch conferences hosted all around the world, um, led by people in the community. And so that, we found that really inspiring. And so, and at this year's Scratch conference, we actually got more than 400 proposals um, and it's just really inspiring to see all the different ways people are using Scratch in their local communities. You can't, oh, I, well, you can't really read that schedule, but uh, the schedule is out on the wall there and you'll have it in your booklet. Uh, we hope you'll, you'll check out a lot of the sessions and meet new people, uh, share ideas, and, and take things away with you that you can, you can use in your, own, uh, in your own communities. But even if you're not hosting a session uh, at the Scratch conference this year, we want to hear your stories. And so some of the folks on the team have come up with these um, prompts to help you think about sharing your story. Um, and actually, you'll find at lunch today these Scratch cards, these little, these little cards with questions on them that help, uh, help you think about how you can share your story. And there's a few different ways we want you to think about doing that. So at, at lunch, at your table, you can share, you can start a conversation with the person next to you at your table, talk about how you're using Scratch. Um, you can also, we, we'll have a kiosk set up on the fifth floor where if you feel inspired, you can go and record your story. Um, and then if you want to tell the world, you can go on Twitter um, and share your story with the hashtag, uh, hashtag Scratch Stories. So we hope that you'll, um, you know, you'll, you'll share what you're working on. We'd love to learn from you, um, and we hope that you'll share with one another. And again, I just want to, I'll end on saying sort of, you know, as we think about the future of Scratch and, and all the things with Scratch 3.0, we're really excited um, to think about how the community will grow along with us. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Scott. So we're going to wrap up with giving you a little bit of an overview and guide to the conference as we're getting started with the conference. Uh, but we're, you know, I think to navigate the conference might require some little guidance. So one thing that was helpful, Champika mentioned, in the back of your uh, name tag, there is a little guide, if you hadn't seen already, that you can pull out that is your conference guide. In there, you'll see one thing is a quick Overview, a quick, the conference at a glance. So I just want to say a few things about this. So you'll see Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And each day, we'll be starting with a keynote session like this one. So we'll be in this hall to get started on Friday and Saturday with the keynote session. And then there'll be various parallel sessions. We see the morning and afternoon sessions. There'll be you know, more than a dozen things happening in parallel at those sessions. You'll be able to look at the listing also in the program to choose different things to go to. Um, and uh, as we do this, the three days are somewhat different. Today is a little different in that all of the sessions, the breakout sessions, are all workshops today. In the future days, there'll also be Ignite Talks and panel discussions. We thought it was great in the spirit of Scratch to get started with more hands-on participatory sessions on day one. So there'll be 90-minute sessions, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. Uh, these were ones that you were asked to register for ahead of time. So in your name tag, you should have tickets for the two sessions you registered for. If you didn't, you should be able to pick up some extra tickets at registration or just go to the tables right outside here if you don't have a ticket. 
But for today, you need to go to the sessions that are registered for. If you're not registered yet, pick up a ticket at the tables right outside the hall and go there. For the next couple of days, for Friday and Saturday, uh, the sessions will be going in parallel and just be going around no pre-registration, but just go to the sessions you're interested in. We hope people will be understanding. You know, as you can tell from, we had these several overflow session at rooms. We really tried to accommodate as many people as possible. There was such demand for the conference. We somewhat stretched to the limits. So we're doing our best to handle it. We really wanted to try to let as many people come because we, it's great that so many people are interested. It does mean we have a large number of people. Some of the sessions might get filled up. So hopefully you'll be to a patient understanding. If a session's filled up, there are a dozen, a dozen other great sessions you can go to. There'll always be sessions at each of the slots in this room, in the auditorium across the hall, in a large auditorium next door. They'll be able to accommodate large numbers of people. So there'll be some places you'll always be able to get into. So I hope you'll be understanding as you try to select among sessions on Friday and Saturday. I mentioned some things next door. So I want to say a few things. Oh, wait, sorry, before that, I do want to say each of those time slots, we're also going to have, there are about you know, 13 or 14 scheduled sessions, but also a couple of unconference sessions. On the wall right outside the hall, there's a whiteboard where you can decide to sign up for an unconference session, sort of an impromptu uh, session. On there, you can write it up. And I think if you see something similar, you can sort of write your name next to it. So we hopefully we can use this board uh, where people can sort of match up, find things going on in, that with similar interests and, and line up together around these unconference sessions in, in two different rooms. Neil mentioned a little about navigating, which in past conferences, it was almost everything was in this building, uh, which is called E14 in MIT speak. Uh, but in order to accommodate more people this time, we're also connecting, there's a building that's connected, the original Media Lab building, which is E15. So workshops and other sessions will be going on in both of those two, two buildings. So the bottom row here is E15, oh, sorry, E14, the building we're in right now. To situate yourself, this is six floors. So as you go across, it shows the different floors. So right now we're on the sixth floor, and this is like Conference Central. So this is where all the meals will be, uh, the lunches, the breakfast, the dinner on Friday night will be here, uh, and some of the larger rooms for the sessions here on the sixth floor. There's also, in this building, down to the third floor, is one of the overflow rooms. So some of you are probably watching this right now. Down the third floor atrium, that's another large space that we'll have for overflow, and also some of the poster sessions will be there. We also, on the fifth floor, have a scratch lounge, a place just to go hang out. It's also where the kiosk will be uh, for sharing your scratch stories that, that Champika mentioned. But then, you can see scattered through the map, there are all sorts of other rooms in both buildings. So if we try to think about how to navigate through, you know, there's also the other building, and notice the arrows here. The two buildings are next to each other, but they're only two floors connected. So trying to give you, the way I generally think about it, if you want to get to something in the other building, go to the third or the fourth floor, cut across the other building, uh, and, and that's the way to move between them. Uh, so uh, if you want to get from the sixth floor down to the other building, you go down to, there's elevators and stairs, lots of different elevators and stairs, go down, cut across third or fourth floor, go to elevators and stairs in the other building, and cut across. So in the other building, in E15, uh, so there, here are the different places to cut across. In E15, as Andrew mentioned, the Scratch 3.0 studio is in the lower level of the other building. So it's about as far, like diagonally across uh, from here, but you can't go diagonally. Uh, so you'll go across, across, and down into the lower level. Also, the lower level of their building is where the other poster session will be. So hopefully you'll be able to figure out how to navigate around. We also have uh, some navigation cards. Outside this room, there are little cards. They'll tell you how to get from the sixth floor of this building right here to any of the other spaces. So pick, if you're going to somewhere, pick up a card, follow the directions on how to get there. Uh, again, a lot of these were done by, we, have, we had two great organizers, Kate Shanahan and Kate Strauss, who, uh, and a designer, Trish, who worked on a lot of these things to help, us, you know, to help people figure their way around. Also, as Andrew mentioned, members of the Scratch team and some other volunteers will be asking, wearing Ask Me buttons. So if you have trouble finding your way around, have other questions, uh, just look for someone with the Ask Me button. You can also tweet, tweet Ask MIT, and we'll have somebody looking at that, and hopefully they'll be able to answer questions for you as well. Uh, 
There should be Wi-Fi through all of the buildings. You don't need any password. Just the, the network is MIT guest. Just go to MIT guest. Shouldn't have any problems. Uh, if you do, ask people at the desks out here. Uh, as you want to tweet about the conference, maybe you already discovered I, I was told that last night MIT, the Scratch MIT 2018 was trending. So a lot of people are already tweeting about it. So we'd love people to you know, share things you're learning, uh, photos you take. Please you know, share things. We'd all like to see it as a community to have a record of the conference. So you know, please you know, tweet from there. And to finally, just like to thank all of this. You know, none of this would be possible without many generous people who have been supporting the Scratch project in general. In particular, for the conference, we've had a lot of great sponsors who are supporting the, the, the work here. So I want to thank all of them. So with that, uh, I'll also mention, in between all the sessions, we've tried to leave a good amount of time for breaks, because we do know a big part of what people get out of conferences is just interacting with one another. So there's like half hour breaks between all the sessions. So we'll move now to a half hour break. There'll be snacks outside. Think about what sessions you want. There's, there's sessions. You should have the tickets for your morning workshops. And that will start in roughly half an hour at 11 o'clock. So again, welcome everybody to Scratch 2018. We really look forward to working to being together for the next few days. <laughs>